Hello, welcome to our course on solar electric energy systems. Give you an overview of our lecture. So today we will start with the potentials of solar energy, the properties of solar irradiance and shadowing is used. Called the greenhouse effect, carbon dioxide is transparent in the visible range, but not transparent in the infrared range. The temperature will increase from two to five degrees Celsius some tipping points then suddenly the impacts will be rather big. So here we have a representation of the world's energy consumption during one year. This is represented by this uh, small cube. Contrast we have all the known resources for example gas you see it's considerably bigger than this cube but that means it only will last for 30 or 40 years. So what we can do, we can use solar energy and it's quite interesting. This big yellow cube, what you see here, represents the solar energy that hits the Earth's surface during one year only. Let's talk about the sun. We talk about solar irradiance, not about sunlight. Light is only usually the visible part of solar irradiance. And this starts at 400 nanometers and goes up to 800 nanometers in wavelength. Now let's take a look at the real scales. So that's actually the real scale, not the real distance, but the real scale of sun diameter and earth diameter. The diameter of the sun is 109 times larger than the one of the earth. If you go to the distance, you come to this representation. So this is sun and here quasi invisible, the earth here. And this is a scaled distance here. It's also not in scale, but it explains very well the astronomical situation we have. So if you have like nowadays in summer, almost summer at the 21st of June, the northern surface is more illuminated by the sun. It's tilted more towards the sun. So we have summer here on the northern hemisphere and the opposite is at the 21st of December. Then the southern hemisphere of the globe is tilted more towards the sun. So it receives more solar irradiance. Have the atmosphere and the atmosphere is absorbing the light not evenly. It's absorbing the different parts of the spectrum in different ways. And therefore it's important to know how thick the, or how long the path lengths of the sun rays through the atmosphere are. So the shortest is if the sun is perpendicular on the Earth's surface. That doesn't occur in Germany, but as I told you, between the equator and 23.5 degrees north and south of the equator, we have at least some parts of the year perpendicular irradiance. And this is called air mass one because the way through the atmosphere is once. And if you have for all different angle, it's longer. For example, if you have an elevation angle of 41.5 degrees, this is AM 1.5. You can calculate that by AM axis one divided by the sinoid of this sun elevation angle. If you plotted this for a whole year, you come to this graph. Let's start with winter here, 21st of December. As we were just discussing some seconds ago, at midday, we have an elevation angle in Berlin of 14.1 degrees. Let's, you can see here, this is sun elevation angle, gamma s in degrees. And here, the solar azimuth, that means in the south, so midday, the sun is directly in south position. The critical part are the lowest irradiance levels, which go down below half a kilowatt hour per square meter per day, not only for a single day, but for a couple of days. And this makes 100% solar power supply in Germany rather difficult. Either you have to super dimension your PV generator quite a lot, so this gives enough supply even during winter, or you have to think about a seasonal storage. This is a map uh, for Berlin. Here we have on the y-axis, we have the elevation angle of the receiver. And here we have the azimuth angle of the absorber of the receiver. Elevation angle, that's clear. 30 degrees is a quite good optimum here, a little bit below 30 degrees, and you will receive a radiance value, accumulated radiance value for all over the year of 1,100 kilowatt hour per square meter per year. If you take a very good 
a location in Europe, it's for example Seville in southern Spain. There we come to about double of that value, 1,700 to 1,800 kilowatt hour per square meter per year of annual irradiance. Let's take a look at Seville. This is now monthly irradiance. So if you have a horizontal mounted system or horizontal receiver, you have an irradiance during one month of 78 kilowatt hour per square meter. If you incline that module a bit, for example, by 30 degrees, then you have a considerably higher irradiance during that month. So it's about 30% more. It's converting incoming photons into a flow of electrons. And this flow of electrons is proportional to the irradiance value. So the flow of electrons is a current, electrical current. And this is directly very good proportional to the incoming irradiance some example of a setup. So you have here the parameter for measuring global irradiance. So irradiance can come from, from all sides, either direct from the sun or diffuse from, this, from the sky or even albedo. So this is a shadow ball. It has to be always repositioned. So it always casts a shadow directly on the pyranometer. This is a counterpart here, the measurement of direct irradiance. That's outline of the obstacles to the line of your the graph of your sun also there is some auto shadowing for example if you have a large pv generator you have installed several rows it's not critical if in summer because the sun is rather high as we mentioned already 60 degrees above the horizon so there is no shadowing here but in winter when the sun is rather low for example 21st of december then we have only eleva elevation angle of 14.7 degrees in paderborn and then the shadow cast is rather long and you have to maintain a very large distance a rule over the sump for germany is that you have to keep a distance of four to six times the height it's a compromise between the energy loss to the shadowing and area loss so if you have to keep a very large distance you have to purchase a lot of land in order to install your pv power plant so this is uh, these are the two rows here what we have as a cross section so we have uh, the first row here with an elevation angle of gamma e and the height of h and the length of the module or the collector is l and the distance between the two rows is d you split that up into d1 and d2 so we have here h is defined by l times sinoid of this angle here so it's just basic trigonometry so you have it in school and here you have d is equivalent to d1 plus d2 d1 is here l the hypotenuse is l times cosine of gamma e or you can express it differently with the pythagoras so it would be here uh, l in square is the sum of d1 square plus h1 square or if you want to express it in d1 d1 is the square root of l square minus h square these are the elevation angle of your modules as i mentioned already for an optimal energy yield in central europe you would take a value of about 30 degrees this is the shadowing angle the actual elevation angle if you go to winter for example for the midday at the 21st of december it's 14 degrees or in the vicinity of 15 degrees for example okay it's 15 degrees in munich so it's a bit southern of Paderborn and Berlin. So we'd have this angle. And if you go to combine those two values, you come here to a land use area of about 36%. And then we talk about the durability of photovoltaic modules and uh, systems. So we talk about the standards, the different tests we have and the different degradation effects. Today we'll talk about durability and uh, quality of PV uh, modules. So we encounter uh, tests, different problems that in, can occur at PV modules and the countermeasures. In particular, we will discuss uh, micro cracks, uh, lamination issues and PID, that's for potential induced degradations. So what tests uh, do we have uh, to encounter that? There are the so-called standard IEC tests. 
So this is usually performance after some stress, some mechanical, thermal or electrical stress. We have uh, the IEC 61215 for crystalline silicon and for thin film modules, the 61646. Additionally, uh, we have uh, non-IEC tests that uh, covers issues that are not covered with the IEC tests. So these are special purpose tests, for example, for extreme sites, salt tests for seashore locations, sand tests for desert locations, ammonia, which escapes from farms, for example, pig farms, or atypical loads. For example, some locations, they have enormous amount of snow or um, a heavy hail. Then we have a newer test, a multi-purpose test of combined loads. Let's first take a look at the traditional IEC 61215 tests and additionally also the IEC 61730 tests. In this graph, you see the IEC 61215 test in blue color and the 61730 test in yellow color. While it's very small here, I just give you a zoom on that. So you have here the upper part of that test schedule. First, you have to get eight modules or seven modules and one laminate. What you do first is so-called preconditioning. And uh, then you see there's a small rectangular here, 10.1, 10.2. That means that you again carry out the 10.2 test. You do again a visual inspection and see whether something is happening, whether something is broken or some extraordinary issues occur then. And then uh, you do the MST 16 test. That means you do a dry insulation test after that. Let's take a look at the entire value chain. It could be some damage during sawing or handling of the wafers later on and the transport of the wafers to the module factory. Then uh, you may have some problems going a step further uh, at the handling of the cells, the micro cracks that occur at the handling or at the soldering, then at the lamination. So have various issues, for example, the temperature cannot be right or the temperature distribution within the laminator could be too high. The pressure of the lamination could be different than required. Also, the duration of the lamination could be wrong. And then during installation, there could be also some problems during unload, unpacking the treatments during installation. Usually there's a high cost pressure at installation and people are paid on the number of installed modules, so they treat them not very carefully. And operation, it could be also stress from mechanical side, thermal side, UV side, depending on the location. For example, if you put it in the desert and you have a high temperature difference between day and night, this could lead some, to some extraordinary test stress. Or ultraviolet radiation, we just recently carried out some tests in Bolivia. There the modules are installed in an altitude above 4,000 meters above sea level, and there the UV stress is extraordinarily high. Last but not least, the hotspots and uh, PID. The underlying issues I will discuss more in particular. So that's PID, the micro cracks, and the lamination.